right, man. So, uh, what, what's the uh, what's the biggest part of your life? Because I see that you know you're big in the music scene. You're you have that ska punk band, um, Deadbeat and Dawn. Uh, just tell me the progress. Tell me what's going on. Um, well, yeah, I've been in bands 20, 25 years. Um, music's always been a, a big part of my life. But, um, yeah, film, writing, they're pretty up there as well. I do a lot of uh, music videos for other bands and stuff like that. So video's always been important. And writing, I've written a lot of feature scripts and stuff like that and had a few made and sold a load. And, yeah, I, I just like to mix it up. I, I don't like to keep my hands tied to one thing. I, I just get bored or, you know. <laughs> so what, what are the scripts been? Have they been for um, something on TV and the movies? What's going on with that? Uh, yeah, I mean, the scripts, uh, I co-wrote Indred, which is um, a 2011 uh, feature, uh, like comedy horror. Okay. Um, and then uh, Attack of the Adult Babies, that was a 2017 comedy horror. Um, that was another feature. But I've, I've sold loads. Um, there was one uh, that was supposed to be uh, directing, and we had the budget for it. Uh, we had about 100, I think it was about 120,000 uh, pounds or so dollars. That's probably about, what, 200 or 180 or something. Um, but yeah, we we were all set to go, and then um, a similar themed film um, from the same investors' country, New Zealand, came out, and um, basically, yeah, that got shelved. So my feature film directing dreams were um, kind of kicked to the street, or kicked to the curb, I'm afraid. The uh, Black Sheep, the movie Black Sheep. No, it wasn't Black Sheep. It was. Um, oh, shit, what's it called? The movie. You are, sorry? Have you seen that movie? Yeah, I've seen it, and there are similarities. Yeah, uh, Deathgasm. Okay. That's what it was called. Yeah, so it was about... Um, a, theirs was like a metal band that kind of... Um, they, they have to battle demons or whatever, and man was about a, a punk band, and they're, they're all alcoholics, so they're battling demons of their own like making, but... They have to battle demons as well. So the similarities were just too close. But um, it might get shot. There's a there's an Argentinian director that's interested in um, bringing it to life. So he, he might end up doing it. I don't own the script anymore. I sold it years ago. But, um, oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah. So is that a lot of what you do? Like you do screenplays or, you know, do you have like yeah. one focus? Yeah, um, no, I do. Um, yeah, I do a lot of screenplays. I've sold a lot, but they just haven't been um, made. So that happens a lot to me, you know. Uh, but I got paid, so I'm alright. <laughs> okay. So the the writing of like short, do you write short stories mainly? Do you write um, full novels, novellas? You know, what's your thing with that? Um, well, yeah, I've, I've written a couple of short stories. Um, I've written a couple of novels. Um, one's pretty close to completion. You know, it just needs a maybe a couple of quick edits, a bit of a polish, but that's that's about ready to go. Um, but other than that, it's just been more or less script work, really, um, screenwriting. Okay. So with, with the novels, is that like, uh, or the, you know, writing shorts or like anything written that's like for a publication as a written, you know, a, a, as a written like book, novel, magazine, entry, whatever, is that more recent? Were you doing uh, screenplays before that? And then you got... I was doing screen... Yeah, I, I, I was doing screenplays before that because um, filmmaking, that, I, I always wanted to make feature films. Um, but dropping out of college, that kind of, um, yeah, that didn't do me any favours in that respect. So, yeah, screenplays were always um, the initial um, instigator in my writing kind of uh, endeavours. Okay, the first I saw of your stuff is I saw it in uh, Slaughterpunk. Um, All right. Yeah. How, how, did, uh, how did that guy get a hold of you? How did Jack Bantry get a hold of you? Oh... Uh, um, I don't know him as Jack Bantry. I know him as Tomo. Um, and basically, I, I, I used to live in the same town as him. Okay. Um, so 
I, I used to go to primary school with him, so I've known him for years and years. So, oh, um, shit. yeah. So we've always been on, you know. Well, yeah, I've known him for years. He's just a man. <laughs> so was was punk rock, like punk rock was a big part of my life, and I, I think that's why that's part of why you got hold of me. Also, I, I think um, like that's right around the time when I was like in all the magazines and everything. So I think you saw like some of my artwork as well. And um, I right, yeah. for the first splatter punk, and then I pretty much done all the covers ever since then, which you know I, I think is great. I, I love doing that stuff. Yeah. No, you've done some good illustrations. They're good okay. stuff, man. Thank you. But um, wait, was punk rock? I mean, you're a ska punk band, so I assume that you know punk rock is a big influence on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it was all kind of Fugazi and uh, Minor Threat and great. I remember seeing them in. Um, I saw them in a church basement in like uh, ninety ninety nine. I mean ninety. 1990 or 1989, something like that. Like, it became oh, like, shaved head. People were still yeah, yeah. dancing. It was like, you know, it, it was hot as balls in there because the church basement and they had those little yeah. tiny windows that were half open. They're all filled with steam and everything. But yeah, it was a great show. And I, I've seen them a bunch of times since. I used to live in Washington, D.C., and that's where they're from. And so I see them all the time. Right. Yeah, but... yeah, um, yeah. For Gazi, Alice Donut, um, I was always into like the more kind of not your traditional punk bands that always did something a little bit different with it, you know. So, For Gazi were always high up there, you know. Right. I like. Uh, I remember I saw the Cramps live. The Cramps were great live. Um, I know there are a lot of uh, British bands. The main one that I was familiar with, it I'm sure everyone's familiar with, is uh, the Sex Pistols, which were yeah. In, in high school, that was my favorite band ever, and I was all about them. I, I know some great bands came out there, like I uh, like Discharge, early Discharge, before they became that like a uh, hair metal band. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> great, you know. I, I just thought Exploited were a little bit kind of like the dumb side of punk rock. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, like, <laughs> yeah, like we do too many drugs and, you know, whatever. But uh, so what was your flavor? What were you into? Um, well, for me, uh, well, as far as Scar Punk, Operation Ivy, um, they're just rule, um, always have done since I can't remember what skate bit it was that, um, first heard them, it might have been H Street or something like that, but, um, yeah, Operation Ivy, they're, they're, they rule the waves. Um, other than that, uh, Blaggers ITA, they were like a, a British kind of punk rap band from early 90s, um, I like uh, DZ Death Rays a lot at the moment. They're like um, an Australian kind of uh, punk kind of metal. They're, they're, they're good. Check them out. They're, they're, they're around at the moment. Do you like some of those? There's some bands that like I really like, but I remember a lot of like the kind of punk purists back in the day. You know, it was uh, oh, that's not a punk band. It's a metal band. But like I like Agnostic Front and Sick of All. And like, you know, nowadays yeah. people call it punk, but... Did any of that grab you? No, I mean, I, I love hip hop as well. So um, I listen, you know, I, I listen to all sorts, you know. So I like to make, mix it up. And as far as being um, a purist, uh, if I like it, I like it. And if they don't, they don't. That's it. <laughs> So with the the whole punk rock, I remember like you know right out of high school, I was like doing fanzines and stuff like that, um, and, and that helped like kind of kickstart my writing career. And I was doing like political cartoons. I, I pretty yeah. the the funny thing about the political cartoons, I did for a magazine that sold on Capitol Hill, like right next to like the White House and the House of Congress stuff. But I pissed off everybody because I hate the Republicans, I hate the Democrats, like they're all crap. So it's like I'm. Yeah. The, of everybody's sacred cows one week but it turns out i was actually the biggest selling card to this because everybody wanted to see what they were offended by this week so <laughs> <laughs> but, but that kind of helped me get started in my whole writing thing is like you know that that kind of got yeah. me out there do you have something like that that kind of got you out there that broke it for you yeah i mean um i guess the first break i had was um if you want to call it a break um it was like winning um the horror channel um it's like a tv channel in the uk okay. and um, yeah. they, used, 
Yeah, they used to run like um, an annual uh, short film competition okay. uh, called Shortcuts. And um, I made a short film for £40 um, and that won the competition and it won the five grand. And I thought that was cool. I'll do another one. So I did another one the following week, following year for 80 quid. And uh, that won again, and uh, they just stopped running the competition after that. So <laughs> I never got to go for a hat trick. But that, that was your kind of like start into like the mainstream or like you know the indie. Yeah, that that got me a lot of connections. Um, I mean, it was uh, premiered at Leicester Square uh, Cinema, uh, Prince Charles Cinema in Leicester Square. Sorry, in London, it's like a an iconic London cinema, you know, so it's, it, it was it was a big thing. There was champagne, there was loads of um, other people. It was, uh, what, what did the screen it at? What's the big um, British film festival, horror film festival? Fright Fest. That's yeah. why it was screened. It was premiered at um, Fright Fest, so. What year was yeah, it? Cool. Um, that was 2000, 2009, and then the second competition that never went to fright fest um but that was 2010 the second but yeah 2009 um that was uh, fright fest again 2011 with inbred um that premiered there as well so and how old yeah. when that kicked off um well 2008 uh what's the i'm 47 now so 2008 um 30 odd <laughs> i don't know i can't do the maths i was in my 30s that? say again sorry what were you doing there before that um bands um getting drunk <laughs> and uh partying yeah Pretty much. Yeah, I, I I had all these dreams of being a writer and artist and stuff, but yeah, it took me a while to kick that off, you know, because first, well, first I was homeless, like living in the woods, rocks and pillow, homeless, you know, oh, crazy. Oh, yeah. all those restrooms, you know, you, like I, I, I scrounged up $2 from begging and I bought a bag of rice and that lasted me for two weeks and that was all I had to eat for two weeks, but yeah. And then I would do like a whole like shit show of jobs, like going to Chuck E. Cheese and like you know door to door for Greenpeace and you know like mm -hmm. and stuff. But when I finally got all that stuff started, it, it seemed like one thing led to another. Um, was that kind of how it happened for you? Um, yeah, but there's always been. I'm, I'm easily distracted, so I'll start doing something, and if it's something that's going to take a you know say more than two or three weeks, um, I'll I'll get bored quite easily and I'll put it to one side, you know, say to myself that I'm going to come back to it. And then about five years later, I probably will drag myself back to it. And um, and then the same will happen again. You know, it's a, it's just a constant cycle. It's just um, I'm, I'm lucky if I actually complete something. Um, like being in a band for 25 years and um, we're only just recording our first album so and um, we've we've written all 15 tracks for it and um, we got, we're booked into the studio in o october but like i said i've been in bands 25 years never done an album so it's um there's how, always time how far do you tour Wait. um oh just uk okay do you have plans of making it like across the pond anywhere oh yeah we'd love to yeah um but it's just time i mean um, I've got kids. I mean, man, uh, the, my youngest now is 14, so they're getting to an age where I can, you know, like bugger off and do stuff. Um, but pretty much everybody in the in the in the band, they've got kids as well. So it's it's the waiting game, waiting until the the kids have, you know, just about ready to be kicked out of out of the house, and then uh, yeah, we can we can go off again. <laughs> so. Is that more your focus? Is music more your focus? Is screenwriting? Is uh, you know, is writing? Um, at the mo yeah, at the moment, uh, definitely my focus is on on music because I really want to get this album done. So, um, like I said, twenty five years, you know, it's it, it's about time we just got this album done. So, the, this album will be out by probably about January, February, and then I'm looking at maybe. 
either tackling um, a long, short film, you know, like 30-minute, 40-minute film, or just uh, taking the jump and doing a Kickstarter project and um, getting a feature off the ground. So that will be the the next thing, and then I'll in in the interim I'll probably work on just getting this novel that I've been kicking around for ten years finished and um, out as well. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a publisher for the novel? Because I I thought the hardest part would be writing my first novel. I found the hardest part is finding a publisher to put it out. Um. Well, uh, Mister Jack Bantry, he's he's already offered so the. Uh, I'll, I'll just go with him. I'll just chuck it to him. I'm not, I'm not going to go look in for anything. So, No, he's good. He put out a couple of my stories in chat books, and I know he's put out other people's novels. I, I'm excited to see where he's gone, because I remember when he first started the Splat Punk scene, and um, I think it was a postman at the time. And uh, yeah. like he's really made his like writing career take off. You know, the I'll, give you three, I'll give you three guesses what my full-time job is. Three guesses what your full-time job is? Actually, no. I'll just give you one guess. Well, I'm going to have to go with Postman. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, excited to see these taken off. Um, I'm a tattoo artist, and I own a tattoo shop. And uh, I originally, uh, I remember, like, are you familiar with Alan Moore and Watchmen? And, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, when I read Watchmen, because I couldn't decide if I wanted to be an artist or a writer, and I read Watchmen, I was like, oh, well, I can do both, because, you know, this is very well written and well drawn. And uh, yeah. it took uh, interviews with a bunch of comic companies and stuff to realize that he kind of, he lucked out. A lot of people don't really get much control and uh, all sorts of, so when, when I finally got writing, you know, it was quite a bit later, but I, I already had a job as a tattoo artist, so... You know, the tattoo yeah. artist was helping to pay my bills. So is that what pays your bills, like being a postman, and then you you write and you're trying to get the screenplay thing going and you're trying to get the band going? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I'd love to just do video work, you know, as a full-time profession, but um, although I do get, you know, work doing band videos for bands, it's so inconsistent that I just can't afford to, you know, live off it. So I have to have a full time job, and um, yeah, so that's it. Plays a big part or takes a big chunk out of my life when I could be doing other creative pursuits, which sucks. But you know, that's life. You've got to put food on the table and you've got to keep a roof over your head. So you well, know, okay, so, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Have you thought about making a video for your novel when it comes out? Um, no, <laughs> it's just no. It'd be just too long. I mean, the the novel it's um it's the first of three. That's what I'm intending. Whether whether the second one will even even happen, I don't know. But it's supposed to be the first of a trilogy, um, and it's like fifty thousand words just the first one, and. I would I would be stuck uh, trying to find what to cut out just to bring it to a feature length. Um, so I would I would just no <laughs> no I wouldn't. What's the novel about, or at least what's the first installment about? Um, it's like um, an apocalyptic kind of event, um, but it leans towards Lovecraftian kind of things as it gets further in. So. That sounds a little cosmic. bit like novels, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, cosmic apocalypse. <laughs> well, what I do is I, I found, because people have very short attention spans, so I'll do like 30, you know, second videos, and like it's enough to like grab you in, but with the yeah. short span, people actually pay attention to it. So yeah, yeah. I, I find like people tend to see them. I, I've heard all sorts of stories, and some people make some horrible videos, but... You know, you could probably throw some cool stuff in there in like thirty seconds. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, it'd be. I don't know. I, I, I do want to make a feature film. It probably wouldn't be from the book because I've already got a couple of scripts that I'm. You know, I'm definitely considering. You know, working out at some point. So, um, 
yeah, I, would, I mean, that's that's why I love filmmaking. You, you've got the best of both worlds. You know, you, you do the, the script, which is the writing element. Then you do, you've do you got the filmmaking element. You've got the whole production process, getting to meet loads of people. And then you've got the editing process where you see it all come together. And I'm in a band, so I can chuck some music in as well. So I, I, for, for me, making films, it, it encompasses pretty much every dynamic that I love in creativity, you know. Right. Do you have a favorite filmmaker or a favorite film? Um, I've got lots of favorite filmmakers and lots of favorite films. Um, I don't know. Favorite filmmaker, um, most consistently, I suppose, would be John Carpenter, um, at least from like mid 70s through to maybe um, his early, uh, very, very early 90s. Like when you did The Thing or like They Live. Yeah, yeah. They Live was brilliant. I think this is an underappreciated classic. <laughs> oh, completely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, John Carpenter, he's, he's definitely up there. I mean, you know, it's, I guess it's all the all the the ones that you could predict, you know, like uh, Sam Raimi and um, George mm-hmm. Romero and people like that. Cronenberg at all? Like The Fly? Right? Are you a fan of Cronenberg at all? Like The Fly and, you know... Um, I don't like The Fly so much, but I do like Videodrome. I love Scanners. Okay. Uh, I love The Brood. Um, Shivers is okay. Um, I like I like his earlier stuff. Um, Dead Ringers was all right, you know, as far as the later ones, but that was a, it was a bit kind of slow going as well. It seems like he kind of went down and he came back. Like, I really like A History of Violence or Eastern Promises. Have you seen those? Yeah. And yeah. I, I heard that uh, Vigo, when he was uh, at London cafes, you know, he had all those, like, fake tattoos on him of rough it, Russian mafia, and people were really scared of him until he started talking. They're like, oh, wait, he's not Russian at all. But <laughs> that, that was the big thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Um... Cronenberg, I don't know, he's a funny one, because I, I do like the body horror aspect, mm-hmm. but the, his, his direction technique is it's almost like watching a TV movie. There's okay. not much, you know, it's, it's very... It's the same with George Romero, actually, as well. It's like, put the camera down and let everybody do, in, do stuff in front of it. Whereas John Carpenter, you know, with, with, with his cinematographer, Dean Cundy, they'd be, like, moving the camera all or You know, there'd be a lot of movement. And and the the it's like Sam Raimi, you know, the the camera becomes almost a character within the film, you know, and I, I like I like that style of filmmaking more so than David Cronenberg's, which is which is great, but it's also very um, uh, perfunctory uh, or staid, you know. It, it's it delivers what it needs to, but it doesn't try to elevate itself above. Right. That's, yeah, that's, what do you think yeah. of uh, Peter Jackson, like Dead Alive and stuff like that? Yeah, um, Dead, Brain Dead, Dead Alive, Brain Dead, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Peter Jackson's great. I don't like his Lord of the Rings stuff. Um, I'm not a big fan of uh, Hobbits at all. Um, I didn't like King Kong. Um, I, for me, the last good Peter Jackson film was uh, The Frighteners. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't really. I really like his take on that. That's a Stephen King story that uh, he made into, like, uh, I, I don't. It's been a long time, but I don't remember liking that so much. I really liked Bad Taste a lot. I liked uh, Dead, yeah, Lord, yeah. Lord, Dead, and then I, I felt like he kind of like was no longer in my zone anymore. But a lot of people that happens with Sam Raimi, they happened with, like, I was in yeah. his like uh, Star Wars. I mean, his uh, Spider Man stuff, and you know. Um, drag me to hell. Well, they were they were still pretty cool though. It, even though Sam Raimi kind of went off to do different test different genres and stuff, he still delivered pretty good films. You know, whereas Peter Jackson, King Kong, man, no, <laughs> I didn't like that at all. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, well, Sam Raimi's a little bit uh, hit or miss too. You know, like some of it. Like I remember for a long time, I loved Evil Dead. That was like my favorite movie. But um, oh yeah, Crime Wave. That was terrible. I forgot about that one. What was? Crime Wave. Yeah. Uh, and he did, um, he, I remember he got the uh, race originally to The Shadow, which would have been awesome. I would love to see The Shadow. But then he lost the race, so he did Dark Man instead. And I thought, yeah. 
it was a little bit more cartoony than you know it would have been for the show, but it wasn't bad. Um, what's that? It was good. Yeah, yeah. What's that one he did with uh, Sharon Stone? It was like a like a western. Uh, the I quick and the dead. Yeah, I, I didn't like that one at all. I thought that like sometimes he goes over the top with his whole like uh, comedy, Three Stooges, whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah. But um, all right. So let's get back to writing for a minute. Um, so. You know, it, as far as the writing stuff, is that, like, uh, did you have a, a break and you started, you know, in the screenplays and you started doing more writing? Or was it kind of like a natural progression? Um, yeah, probably a natural progression because um, with, 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 with the break in, in, in the video aspects, um, there wasn't so much of a script. Um, there was, you know, it was a, a two-minute film stop, so you can't, Squeeze too much narrative into two minutes. Right. Um, although it does have a, a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, which is always important. <laughs> um, you know, but yeah, I, I don't know. It just it just kind of went from that really, because um, doing the um, doing the film work and then doing scripts and evolving into feature scripts and and things like that. And I think working with uh, Alex Chandon, the co-writer and director of uh, Inbred, I think that was a, a definite push towards the writing aspect as well um, because it gave me a bit of confidence in, you know, in, in the writing aspects. Um, so, yeah, it's just been a very, very slow, very slow progression. Okay, is uh, some of the short stories or the uh, like the novel you're working on? Is it did it originally start as a screenplay? Was it something you realized was better envisioned as uh, a written story? Um, yeah, no, the, the, I never intended them to be screenplays. I, I kind of separated them from. Uh, I, I like to. I, I, I love wordplay, you know, in. Um, uh, the written word, you know, that I love it when um, people use words that I'm, I'm not really kind of uh, accustomed to, but it sounds great, and it, you know, so that's what I wanted to do. You can't really do that with scripts so much, um, right. and I love adding the detail uh, because with writing um, short stories and novels and things like that, you can, you, you are the director of of, of your own kind of film but it leaves enough interpretation for other people to draw whatever they want from it whereas a film itself just pushes everything in your face you know and you that there is no alternative there is no interpretation that's how it is apart from narrative subtext which you can interpret differently but um yeah i, I love the just adding the detail um you know and things like that just creating the texture so, do you feel that you need to bring the visual aspect of like a, a filmography piece into a written piece? Like, you know, <clears throat> some people are way more descriptive, like John Steinbeck is very descriptive of what's going on, and some people are very, very loose, and like you can hardly envision what they're talking about at all. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I like to get bogged down in uh, description. <laughs> I enjoy that. Okay. What, what about backstory? Because, uh, like, it seems like there's been kind of a move away from doing the backstory. Like, it used to be everything from, like, movies to books and everything. They <clears throat> have more of a setup, and, like, you get to know everything that was going on before everything went to shit. You know, like, like for instance, uh, one of my favorite books is um, Lucifer's Hammer, which I don't know if you read it, but it's like a giant meteorite hits the earth and everything goes to shit. You know? Yeah. He spends, like, a, a decent period in the beginning of the book, you know, setting up everybody going about their normal lives before it all goes to shit. So when it goes to shit, you really feel the impact. You know, I know a lot of stuff nowadays, you just want to start out right at the moment. So they start out right when the meteor hits. They want to start out, you know, with telling you who was affected. Yeah, um, I guess... I mean, they're, they're creative choices, aren't they, really? That, that's, um, I guess what people are trying to do is maybe create 
their own sequels to their favourite films almost. So you've had the backstory in a, in a previous thing. Oh, it's a, a, a well-trodden kind of story of that impending doom. So let's skip past the impending doom. We'll get to the exciting stuff. We've got the doom. Right, what's going to happen next? Right. And I think that's that's possibly what's what's happened. You know, people are, are just looking back on other works and thinking, well, that's been done, that's been done, that's but let's just see what happens after that, you know, that and maybe that's 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 the way it's gone. I don't know. Um, but with me, um, backstory, um, I, I don't know. It's no, <laughs> never really bothered with back, so much backstory. I, I like to have a, a, a character that's well written or, or that you can relate to, um, or, or is at least likable in, in the story, you know, and get to know the character a, a little bit. But um, yeah, I, I, if it works, it works. So I, I, I don't think it's like an important factor in in the writing process um well, and i don't think it's go on sorry what would you do to convey the like kind of what's going on with the character or like you know wh where he's coming from or what his opinions were or, or anything without without writing the backstory um how would you convey that well, I mean, you could do it in flashbacks, couldn't you? Um, there's multiple ways. You can just drop subtle hints, you know, like... Um, like the, yeah, with the events that occur in front of him or whatever? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a multiple way. I mean, you could even use the backstory as part of the main thrust of the plot that's revealed kind of later on in, in the story. So... There's a million ways you could play a story, and there's a million ways you can, you know, perform it. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's just all good. Throw it in the mix. So when you said about telling the story, do you like to um, kind of like have the whole thing like laid out in your mind, or maybe on paper first, and then get oh. it, or do you just have no. like, sort of an idea? Where, where do you start with? I, I just yeah, I just usually have. Um, like the kernel of an idea, you know, the the, the most basic um, premise that you could probably write on, you know, right on your back of your hand. Um, and then from there, I'll, I'll think, right, so where's it going to start? What the character's going to be? And then that's it. And I'll just start from the beginning and I'll, I'll write in sequence till I get to the end. And um, I'll let the story almost take me on on the journey, you know, rather than me force the story out so, so you um, know where it's necessarily going to go until you start like putting it all out there and then you're like oh well, this is kind of the natural progression from where i'm at yeah uh, yeah and and it's very rare that i go back over anything and and change anything substantially um i'll change small elements small things like um for for example like the way someone's killed or or something like that but I won't exact. I won't necessarily change the structure of the story, or, or remove any scenes, or um, or add too much. So it, it generally, as as I write the first draft of it, and I write it from the beginning to the end, it generally just stays as that first draft with very very minor uh, tweaks. You know. Do you find yourself like uh, I, I don't know because if it takes you a while to put out a finished product. You know, probably by the time that you get to like three quarters of the way through it, you have a brilliant idea, but you're like, I should have introduced that a little bit earlier. Do you go back and like try to bring the spore of the element in earlier so you can develop it later on in the story? Um, I'm trying to think of an example where I might have done that and I can't think of any. Um, yeah, no, that doesn't generally happen. It's It's a case of going back and seeing, you know, uh, illiteracies or, you know, just little crap bits of dialogue. Oh, what did I write that for? That's shite. And I'll, I'll change the, the bit of dialogue, you know, the line, and, and that's about it. But, yeah, there's nothing nothing drastic or major that I, I usually change. I, I well, change. Some people, they're, like, super, super technical. So, like, everything is, like, tightly structured, so they have to go back and alter something so it affects something later on. Um, I guess if you're a little bit looser, that's not as much of a concern. 
well, I would try. I would probably what I would do is try and adapt what's going to happen later on to what's happened earlier on, rather than do it the other way around. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now I understand. Yeah. What's um. What's your feeling on like first person versus third person, like the the whole way that you bring the story to life? Like one of my favorites is Lovecraft, and he would do everything first person, you know, and then yeah. a lot of people do everything third person. And you know, personally, I like to mix it up a little bit, but it, it, I'm sure everyone has their flavor, and there's some of my favorite authors that only stick with the one or the other. Um. Yeah, I, I'm probably third person. Yeah. Okay. Have you have you tried venturing into the other thing at all, or is not really something that interests you? Um, I've never. I don't think there's ever been a story that's really kind of made me think, "Oh, that'll work in that," and I'll do it in that style. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it'll happen one day, maybe. Um, but, yeah, just at the moment, it just hasn't happened. All right. And uh, let me go through a few more things. I'll, I'll let you go. I don't want to keep you here all day. But um, so do you focus, like, I would say that my stuff is not necessarily horror, but I always try and take, like, kind of a darker perspective on stuff because that's what I like. Do you have a, like, a thing that you feature in yours? Like, also, like, I grew up as a teenage punk rocker, so I always, like, you know, put portions of my life into my writing, you know, so I, I'm wondering what your take is on all that. Um, I, I love fantastical stories, you know, like, I love my horror to be monsters, supernatural, um, some things that can't possibly happen today, tomorrow, or 10 years down the line. I, I love things that are just very much out of the ordinary. Um, and that's generally what I'm drawn to write. Um, I mean, well, with short films, budget obviously is a factor. So if you can't afford like a 300 foot tall lobster, then, you, you know, you'll have a guy, you know, with a black glove, you, yeah. you know, and a knife. But, um, but yeah, my desire is always to be as fantastical and I, I, I love cosmic horror. I love Lovecraft and I, I love um, I love a lot of the films that are coming out at the moment, like uh, Mandy and um, The Void, Color Out of Space. I like you know, the, some. I didn't I didn't feel as strongly about Mandy, uh, but I like The Void. Have you seen Event Horizon? I thought Event Horizon was a yeah, cosmic yeah. horror sort of thing. Yeah, that was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, that that that's my bag. You know, that's that's the kind of thing um, I, I really like. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, what what are you working on right now? Are you mainly working on like you said you need to complete the album? You said you need to complete the book. Um, what, yeah. How can people find it? Right. Um, well, at the at the moment, we're working on the, the album in the bands. Um, I mean, you can check out the bands uh, "Deadbeat at Dawn." We're on Spotify, uh, Facebook, um, all the usual kind of social media things. Um, and I'm currently editing a music video for a band called Nosebleed, who are like a punk rock kind of three piece. Um, and that's got kind of satanic kind of imagery and stuff like that going on in it. And, um, That'll be up on YouTube in a few months, I guess. Um, but yeah, for for my films, uh, well, short films and music videos, you can go to YouTube, either look for my name or look for Thirst Ploitation, uh, which is T H I R S K P L O I T A T I O N. So if you look for Thirst Ploitation, that should bring up some of my music videos, um, possibly some of the short films. Um, Inbred, uh, one of the features, you can watch that. Um, I think it's on Amazon Prime for free. Um, and the same with Attack of the Adult Babies. I think that's on Amazon Prime for free as well. Um, the books, um, you'd be looking at Jack Bantry <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Splatterpunk. The cartel, I think, is his uh, like uh, company that he puts it out on. But yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. 
All right, so uh, all right, is there is there anything else that you want to tell everybody? Anything you want to get across? Um, be excellent to every each other. That's all. <laughs> well, I'm sure. Yeah, just everybody be good, be nice, and um, respect your fellow man. <laughs>